yesterday's prophecies for today's world. But greater is he who is in you than he who is in this world. The Holy Spirit dwells in every believer and he is in you and you need not be afraid. And now, how Lindsay's Bible study, the book of John. I want to take up three questions. Where did John write this gospel? When did he write it? And why did he write it? Those are three imperative questions. And we need that kind of background to really understand this, this gospel. Now, if you've had the Bible as literature in some secular university, you've probably been exposed to some of the arguments that are spun out by people who don't believe the Bible and who, who want to make spoof out of it, where they say, well, you know, there's the synoptic gospels, so the Matthew, Mark, and Luke. These are really historic. And then you've got the Gospel of John. It's entirely different, and, you know, it's, uh, it can't really be trusted, and so forth. And the idea, there's a great deal of uh, ballyhoo made about the fact that the Gospel of John is very different in its approach to presenting the life of Christ than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In fact, the material in the Gospel of John is largely unique. Material found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke uh, is uh, a great deal of it you'll find in all three of them. So they try to make the idea that, uh, well, you know, there are errors and stuff because everyone doesn't speak about the same thing and present it in the same way. Well, let me just go into a little bit at the beginning, why are there four Gospels? Why are there four accounts of the life of Jesus Christ? Why didn't God just uh, choose one man and write a complete compilation in one book? Well, God had a purpose, as always, in everything that he did, especially with his word. And when the uh, New Testament era began, the life of Jesus, his death, and his resurrection, there were three cultures that ran through the whole Roman Empire, three different cultures. One was the Roman culture. The second was the Greek culture. You know, Alexander the Great had such an impact on the world that it, even long after his death, he had so, uh, he had used a different tactic as a conqueror. He, he not only conquered nations, but then he invited them to adapt the great Greek culture. And he tried to make them into friendly, uh, friendly, uh, ruling nations that he had. And so he spread the Greek culture all over the known world, and of course it spread. Then the Romans came along, and they conquered what was uh, what Alexander and his four generals had left. And yet, when they when the Romans took over, they did not, or nor were they able to stamp out the Greek culture. So. Uh, if you lived in the Roman Empire in that day, if you wanted to do any kind of commerce, you had to speak Latin and Greek and the language of your own native country. So most people were trilingual. But the Latin and Greek spread through the whole Roman Empire. And of course... When you come to the area of Israel, they had the Jewish culture. So you had three different cultures that run through the, the known world. Well, 
God chose three different men to give three accounts of the life of Jesus. Matthew, who actually composed a gospel that was specifically written to appeal to the Jewish culture. Now, every person who writes a history has a purpose. You can't write a history without having some guiding purposes. So, <coughs> Matthew's uh, God-given, God-inspired purpose was to select from the true events of the life of Jesus the things that would most appeal to the Jewish culture. And so that's why it begins with a genealogy. As an author, I, I would that would be the death of any book to begin with a genealogy. Ho hum. But not to a Jew. You say that this person you're presenting is the Messiah? Okay, give me his genealogy. And that's what Matthew starts with. And he features prophecies of the Old Testament that appeal to the questions a Jewish mind would have. So that's why he, uh, his gospel has a certain spin to it, a God-given spin to appeal to the Jewish culture. Then you have the gospel of Mark. It's named the gospel of Mark because Mark wrote it, but he's not the author. Peter is the author of the gospel of Mark. And Mark wrote it. But in writing it, Peter wanted to appeal to the Roman culture. So he took from his true witness of the events of the life of Jesus, the things he did, the things he said, and the Holy Spirit took that and he inspired him to write down the things that would most appeal to a Roman. See, a Roman had no interest in uh, genealogy. He didn't, the Roman didn't have any particular interest in great scholarship. What the Roman wanted is you say this man is the son of God. Okay, what did he do? A Roman would want to know, okay, you tell me the things he did that would convince me that he was the Son of God. So you read the, Mark, the Gospel of Mark, you read Jesus performs one miracle, and it says, and immediately he moved on and he did another thing. Immediately he went on and he did another. He just compiled one act of power after another. So it was written to appeal to the Roman mind. And of course, in, in that day, one of the most reliable, trusted witnesses in the Roman Empire would be a centurion. The centurions at that time were the backbone of what the Roman legion was. And so the centurion who conducted the crucifixion brings out the highlight of the Gospel of Mark. What did he say? It says, Jesus cried out with a great voice. And then he just bowed his head and died. And the centurion who was standing right in front of him, as he died, looked up and said, Surely this man was the Son of God. You see, that was a witness a Roman would take great stock in. And they did. But then we come to the Gospel of Luke. Luke wrote it. And he compiled testimonies that he took. And the Gospel of Luke was written to appeal. What's the other culture? Greek. It was written to most appeal to the Greek mind. Now, you read the first chapters of the Gospel of Luke, and it starts out exactly the way the scholars of that time would do it. He carefully dates the time, and how does he do it? 
Well, by who was Caesar? Who was the local governor? Who was the provincial go uh, provincial governor? And so forth. And he triangulates those things so that you can pinpoint exactly when these things happen. And he carefully, uh, he, he makes careful note of the fact he's researched this. And he makes note of the fact that the people that he is quoting were personally there and that they were, uh, they were eyewitnesses. But a great deal of the Gospel of Luke reflects the Apostle Paul. Did you know that? Luke, you know, Paul was always getting in jail. And it's hard to be a friend to, a, to your a close friend, someone who's always in jail. So Luke spent a lot of time sitting in jail with Paul. And during that time, he was writing his gospel. And he wrote things. He wrote, to, he took the, the true facts of the life of Jesus, but he used them along the lines of his purpose, which was to appeal to the Greek mind. You see, the Greeks worship the con concept of the perfect human being. And uh, they tried to show it in their statuary, and they tried to show it in their uh, lofty things about what a, what a great man, what a great human being would be, the kind of person he would be, and so forth. Well, the Gospel of Luke emphasizes not so much the prophecies the Jews would want, not so much the great miracles that Jesus did. It emphasizes the things that Jesus said. It emphasizes the superhuman wisdom with which he spoke. And uh, it was a very powerful, powerful gospel to the Greek culture. Of course, they're, they're all powerful, but you have to know this in order that when you read Mark or you read Matthew or you read Luke, you see that certain things are included in one that's not in another. Well, the reason is because of the writer's purpose, not that he didn't know about it. Then we come to the Gospel of John. Oh, you see, Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written soon after Jesus died. They were all written. Uh, they were all written before Paul was put to death. They were all written before 60 A.D. So they were written by eyewitnesses who had been with Jesus. And frankly, they had not really digested the just spellbinding fact that they had walked, talked, eaten, laughed, slept with the creator of the universe. I mean, it hadn't really fully sunken in. And that's why when the Apostle John wrote his gospel, it was a long time after that. John was the one who was just a, a young teenager when he was with Jesus as a disciple. And he lived until at least 101 to 103 AD. And uh, so he had a lot of time. He knew Jesus more intimately than any of the others. And he had a lot of time to go over and over about what he had experienced. <clears throat> and that's why <clears throat> when you read the Gospel of John, he doesn't really write to the Greek, the Roman, or the Jewish culture. He writes to all who would come after. And he had a very, very def definite purpose. But uh, when did he write it? That's the first question I want to ask. He wrote it 
after he wrote the book of Revelation. In fact, the last book of the New Testament that was written was the Gospel of John. Last book of the canon. You see, he wrote the Gospel of John after he had been released from Patmos. Let me read you a few things. This is from the testimony of Irenaeus, who was the bishop of Lyon in AD 160, and he got this information directly from the personal disciple of the Apostle John himself, Polycarp, who lived from A.D. 70 to 160. And this is what he got directly from Polycarp. He said, and I quote, All the presbyters who met with John, the disciple of the Lord in Asia, Asia was what we would call now Asia Minor. It uh, was primarily what is now modern Turkey. It's where Ephesus, Smyrna, uh, Philippi, and all of these ch churches were. And uh, it says, all the presbyters who met with John, the disciple of the Lord in Asia, give testimony that he conveyed to them these things, for he lived with them even to the time of Emperor Trajan. And some among them saw not only John, but also other apostles, end quote. That means that sometime between 98 and 101 A.D., John the Apostle wrote the Gospel of John. And uh, he did it at the urging of all the presbyters, or the we'd call them uh, elders of the churches of Asia. They urged him to write his, his view of Jesus, which reflected a depth of understanding of Christ's deity that none of the other Gospels reflected. You see, he, he had lived long enough, reflected over and over again in the power of the Holy Spirit on all that he had seen and heard and witnessed with Jesus. And he distilled all of that in understanding that this man that he loved, that died for him, was none other than the second person of the Godhead. And so they wanted him to write a gospel that would reflect that kind of uh, man, Jesus. It would emphasize that he was a man who willingly laid aside the use of his divine power, his deity, in order to live as a man. But it shows that he always was God in the flesh. So that is why he wrote it primarily. But uh, it says that, once again, this is uh, from Eusebius, and uh, he, is, he is talking about uh, history. Eusebius lived in the 300s. He, he was the first church historian. Eusebius wrote about the fact that uh, uh, there was witness of the elders of Asia to this fact. It says afterwards, that is after John was in Patmos, it says John the disciple of the Lord, he who leaned on his breast, published the gospel while he lived in Ephesus in Asia. But the point is, John was released from prison when Domitian, Emperor Domitian died, he was the one that put all the Christians in prison. When he died, the next emperor let him go. Nerva was the next emperor. He only he was an emperor for one year. They didn't like him very much. <laughs> they killed him off. And then came Trajan. And it was during the time of Trajan that, that he came from Patmos back to uh, Ephesus. And uh, there is where John did his principal ministry uh, until he died. Now, I've been to Ephesus many times. It's one of the most spectacular uh, 
archaeological sites that still exist. It's beautiful. I mean, you can still see where uh, uh, Paul had walked. You can see the, the big front facade of the, the library. And uh, you can also see the, 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 the great theater that Paul was dragged into and almost killed. It's still standing. And uh, so it's, it's a spectacular sight. But one of the things that I believe is a reliable archaeological site there is the grave of Jesus' mother, Mary. She's buried there. And traditions had it all along that she was buried there. Now, why would she be buried there? Because Jesus said, behold your mother. He put his mother into John's care. And John took care of her. So wherever he went, he took her with him. John died in Ephesus. Mary died there too. So the Gospel of John was written in Ephesus because the, the, uh, all of the elders of the various churches that were all, all through that part of the country, which is now basically Turkey, all of those elders got together and urged him to sit down and write this gospel. And he did. And thank God he did. Now, when was it written? Well, just about answered that and answering why. Uh, it, was, it was written, I believe, about 99 A.D., shortly before he died. So... That was the last book of the canon of scripture to be written. And it reflects a high, high view of Jesus, a mature view of Jesus. Why did he write it? Why, from his point of view, did he write it? Well, I want to ask you another question. What's the best selling book in the history of the world? No. the Gospel of John. Because you see, we find more evidence of the spread of the Gospel of John than any other book of the Bible. And that will answer why he wrote it. That's why when I taught this at uh, UCLA, when I was with Campus Crusade for Christ, 1962, I had a red-headed uh, uh, kind of a, a timid guy named John Reardon who was in the class. He was one of the disciples. And I was teaching about why John wrote this and the persecution he went through and all of that. And I mentioned the fact that, you know, evidence shows that the Gospel of John was the most circulated book of any book in history. And I said, the reason John gives us. And let's look at that reason. John chapter 20. Now I'm reading from the New King James Version. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. All right. Now that's very, very important because it tells us that John was aware of the other Gospels and he was aware that what he wrote didn't include everything that they wrote about. And the whole church bears witness. There, this verse is not only a statement of John, it's also a statement of the church, of all of the elders says many and truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book so he tells us look there are all kinds of things I could have put in this book but I selected these why but these are written 
for the purpose that, purpose clause. These are written for the purpose that, number one, you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, literally. And second, that you may believe that he is the Son of God. And that believing, you may have life in his name. All right, there are three key words in here. The first is Jesus did many other signs, Simeon. It's a word that's used all through the Gospel of John. There are three different words in the Greek New Testament for miracles. One is Simeon, another is Teros, and I didn't look up the other one. I wish I brought my Greek text. But uh, I know that uh, John uses the word Simeon throughout his book. The reason is because Simeon means a, it looks at a miracle, something that sets aside the rule of nature, something that is uh, an impossibility that is performed. But Simeon emphasizes not so much the miracle itself, but what it means. Join us next week for the continuation of How Lindsay's Bible Study of the Book of John. But when you really get a grip on the fact that Jesus so saves you when you simply admit your sins and receive the gift of pardon, that you are already in heaven as far as he's concerned. As I prepared for this week's program, I was again struck by the speed with which events are moving into the scenario the prophets predicted for the end times. I believe we're there. People on the street are talking about what all of these things mean. Folks that wouldn't darken the door of a church or pick up a, a Bible are now very curious. This may be our greatest opportunity maybe even our last opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ before we're silenced by political correctness. The message that God has given me is more important now than it's ever been for the church and for the nation. That's why I'm asking you to help me to expand our reach. You can find more of Hal Lindsey at his website, www.howlindsey.com. There you can access our video and article archive.